Hello and welcome to Studio 415. On today's show, you'll see why the district is advocating for more funding for public schools. You'll hear a story of a past Olympian who now drives a bus at Nax. And you'll find out how several CHS students are trying to get the attention of Olympic scouts. All of that and more coming up next. Welcome to Studio 415. I'm Megan Holt. And I'm Amelia Cisna. In 2008, the nation suffered a recession that floored many and caused the federal and state governments to cut corners wherever possible. Although the recession has long since gone, the effects of it are still being felt, including by us students. Studio 415 reporter Drew Wilberger has the story on the impact of this recession on NACS and the district's ongoing fight for funding. Although historically most schools have had funding via local property taxes, the state government took sole responsibility of financing the general fund in 2009, which is the pool of money any government entity draws their cash from. These entities include local police and fire stations, courts, as well as schools. When the now infamous recession hit every state in America, Indiana was hit hard, with Hoosier Public Schools taking a large brunt of the impact. Since 2000, Indiana has lost the most amount of funding towards public education out of any state. This is largely due to the cuts towards public schools funding that occurred during this time. NACS in particular felt the effects of the cuts, with 37 teaching and administrative positions being cut across the district in 2009. Alongside this, every administrator took a minimum of a 3% pay cut. The following year, every NACS employee took a 3% pay cut. And still further, some administrators took yet even more pay cuts. All of this was to, quote, live inside our means, language referring to the state law that public schools cannot spend more than they make. Since then, funding has been steadily creeping back up, and NACS has been able to fill a few more teaching positions, as well as pay high-performing teachers better to incentivize their staying within NACS. Despite this, the district's state funding is still 7% what it was in 2009, once adjusted for inflation. With the current funding, NACS is forced to perform a balancing act, trying to fund the money to pay their current teachers well enough to support themselves, while also scraping together what is necessary to hire new teachers is a difficult task. All things considered, if NACS received the proper state funding, it would have $3.5 million for the district. This would average out to around three to 5,000 extra dollars per teacher in the district. Ever since the reduction in funding, Dr. Chris Hemsel has been spearheading a movement to get the district this money it was promised. For nine years, the superintendent has been pushing for more funding, not only for NACS schools, but for public education as a whole. Hemsel says that with matters like these, it's better to use the tortoise approach as opposed to the hare. It is similar to a dripping faucet. Um, you know, you don't fill the sink up quickly when there's a drip in the faucet, but eventually the, fa the sink does fill up. And so for nine years, we've tried to, to, to have a consistent message about why the funding is important, why it's needed, why it makes a difference. Although the funding has been a crisis for almost a decade at this point, recent events provide a glimmer of hope. Five state legislators visited Carroll High School on March 22nd in order to see just why Hemsel believes the schools need more funding. The legislators arrived at the high school in the morning to be greeted by culinary arts students and their freshly cooked treats. After an informative presentation by Himsel detailing the impacts of the lack of funding on the district, legislators were shown a short video about Champions Together produced by Carroll Sr. Peyton Minnell. After this, the legislators took a short tour in which they visited a government class creating podcasts, an AP bio class experimenting with taste-altering chemicals, then saw once again the culinary arts program in their kitchen. They also visited the PLTW classrooms in the process of both manufacturing and designing their projects, as well as the animal science classrooms. Finally, they saw the weight rooms to see how students were encouraged to lead an active lifestyle, then finishing in the music department to witness a short performance. U.S. Congressman Jim Banks also visited at a later date. This event was the culmination of the work Himsel has put in over the past nine years, the relationships administrators have built with politicians, and the work of the Charger Advocates, a group of NSCS parents working in supporting Himsel's cause. All of this was in efforts to convince legislators that these programs and teachers are necessary and important to education, as well as to provide a more human element to the story. It's a lot easier to cut a program when it's something printed on a piece of paper. It's a lot harder to cut a program when you actually see faces and names behind the program and you see success stories 
Um, and that's what we tried to do. We tried to share with them success stories. With the current funding from House Bill 1001, which includes the funding for any government-run entity, many of these programs would see their funding get slashed. This would result in either a diminished learning experience or, in extreme cases, the disappearance of the program altogether. The good news is, state legislators all said that their experience at Carroll helped to form their opinions going forward. In Indianapolis, we make a lot of decisions, it's what we do, but a lot of research goes into trying to find ways to make the right decision and getting out of the office, coming out right on the front lines of public education to learn about how it's being done is exceptionally important in making a good decision. While Himsel hopes that the visit helps state legislators see why NACS needs more funding, at this point, the decision is mostly out of his hands and rather rests on the shoulders of the legislators themselves. House Bill 1001 still has to go through a lengthy process in order to be accepted as law. The bill is projected to be debated for some time and in the worst case scenario, could remain a bill as late as June. Though from educators and students' perspectives, the extra funding may seem like an obvious choice, there's more to the decision. House Bill 1001 includes the funding for every government-run entity, such as law enforcement and courts. Each one of these entities makes a good case for more money, meaning the politicians in Indianapolis must make hard choices from time to time. Over time, school funding has consistently increased, but you run into a difficult place with how much does it cost to educate a student? How much more is needed or is more needed? And those are hard, those are difficult questions, and that coming here today helps me kind of get my mind around where the funds are being used. Well, I, I sympathize. I do understand the funding needs are, are extremely high. Uh, what we need to do in today's dollars, we've had problems over the years with funding being lower than what's, what's expected and needed. Uh, we've taken a lot of our budget, we've increased our entire budget almost $1.9 billion this year. Uh, $611 million of that went to education. Unfortunately, our budget is such that the money is scarce. We have to find creative ways to come up with more funding. If you wish to push for Himsel's cause, every one of the legislators said that contacting your district representative is the best way to have your voice heard. For Studio 415, I'm Drew Wilberger. While you might not know it off a passing glance, seemingly ordinary people around you may have more to them than what meets the eye. Studio 415 reporter Jacob Newland had the chance to talk to an Arcola bus driver with a unique story to tell. In the summer of 1968, Sharon Wickman, then a 16-year-old girl from Fort Wayne, Indiana, won the gold medal in the women's 200-meter breaststroke. Now, over 50 years later, the now-married Sharon Jones still wakes up bright and early at 5 in the morning. But she does so for a different reason, to drive a bus for Arcola Elementary. While Sharon might seem just like a normal person on the surface, she holds a fascinating and inspiring story. Here's what she told me about her Olympic experiences. I dreamed of going to the Olympics when I was 12 because when I first started, it wasn't on TV then, so I only heard about it and I built it up really big in my head. So what was it like when you, like, you realized that I just won a gold medal? I touched the wall, I turned and looked to see the board and the board shows first place only. That's all you know is who got, what lane got first place and I saw I did. I started crying. That's as soon as I hit the wall and turned and looked. I kept thinking, am I dreaming, am I dreaming, or is this really happening? So what was your favorite part of the Olympic Games? Winning. That was what I went there for, and that put me on cloud nine. But you know, it wasn't really a big deal there, because our whole Olympic team was just amazing. Uh, the very best part, I guess, was afterwards, after all the ceremony and getting the medals, I got to go up in the stands and be with my my parents who had driven all the way from Fort Wayne and my best friend who lived in Mexico because we had lived in Mexico earlier, a couple years earlier. Despite her amazing accomplishments, Jones says she is still just your average person and touched on her experience with driving the bus. So you said like your life was pretty hectic for those few years. Yeah. So like what does the day for you look like today? So I get up at five in the morning because I had to make sure my bus is ready to go um, by 5.30. And I drive the school bus, and then I come home and feed my animals, eat some breakfast. Then I usually have phone calls to make or bills to pay or something to do like that or an appointment. Like, when did you start, like, um, doing the bus route? When my youngest son was in middle school, a girlfriend kept saying, you like kids, you ought to drive a school bus. You'd be great at it. And, and I've loved it ever since. I feel privileged to be able to do it. Yeah, I had a, a kid say, why, why do you drive a school bus? Do you like doing that? I go, 
well, I don't so much like driving the bus, I like driving you. And he goes, why? And I said, because I love you guys. And he goes, you love all of us? And I go, yeah, even the naughty ones. <laughs> They're the ones you get to work with. Mm -hmm. With all of her accomplishments, hard work, and dedication, Jones made sure to add in some advice for the students of Carroll and anyone who has high goals to reach. If you have a dream and you have a passion for something, don't do it halfway. Give it everything you got. Don't get discouraged when things don't look like they're going right. And don't let anybody tell you you'll never do that because that's what people said to me. If you don't try and give it everything you've got, you'll never know if you could have. So, and if you, if you don't achieve it, at least you tried, you know? What do you, what do you have to lose? Actually, achieving the goal wasn't the real thing I got out of that. It was the process of sticking with something and working hard. And I've used that all through my life and everything I've ever done. Uh, any parting words, anything else you want to say? I would just like to say that swimming in the Olympics is one of the biggest highlights of my life, along with um, getting married and having kids. But those are all worldly things. The biggest highlight in my life was coming to know Jesus Christ. That's, that was life changing. For Studio 415, I'm Jacob Newland. From competing at Lucas Oil Stadium in the marching band to wrestling in Banker's Life Fieldhouse, students here at Carroll are given many chances to exercise their talents on a larger scale. While the Olympics may seem like a scale too large for high schoolers, some students here at Carroll are exceeding those expectations. In my report, I had the chance to talk to four rifle team members about their opportunity to compete against other potential Olympians. The Olympics are notorious for featuring some of the world's best athletes of all kinds. Most people, however, are unaware of the tedious process it takes to compete in them. The Junior Olympics program helps aspiring athletes to gain the attention of Olympic scouts by allowing exceptional student athletes to compete against each other. These Junior Olympians come from all over the country, and four students from here at CHS qualified with their talents in rifle shooting. Seniors Courtney Brewer, Sam Lawson, and Corey Schreiber qualified for the National Rifle Championship, along with sophomore Ben Butler, who has been a competitive rifle shooter since he was eight years old. You compete against anybody from people that get paid to do it, like the AMU, Army Marksmanship Unit. Then there's also people that are on the World Cup team, which travel internationally, and it's the best of the best of the country just competing against each other. In order to reach the Junior Olympics, the rifle team has to dedicate a lot of time to their craft. The rifle team practices three nights a week for two hours a night at the X Count near Space Fitness Center. They compete in multiple other events sponsored by USA Shooting throughout the year, such as the state championship as well as national qualifiers, which determines which students receive an invitation to the national competition. Due to the cost of the event, only three of Carroll's four qualifiers attended nationals. Still, they represented their team very well. The Junior Olympic Rifle Shooting Championship took place over the course of 23 days, with different days dedicated to various types of shooting. The men's rifle competition, which Schreiber, Lawson, and Butler competed in, occurred from April 6th to the 12th in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The event was a great opportunity for them to showcase their talents, as well as to meet fellow shooters. They enjoy the vibe of this event and the connection that they form with other athletes. Really, it's just a lot of the people and the camaraderie, um, being together with everyone. I've met, like, eight Olympians, Olympic level athletes, and they just talk to you like a normal person. So it's, it's different from other sports. You talk off and on during the year, but you go out to the matches and you just hang out, shoot, hang out again, have dinner, and it's a great time and they're relationships that'll last for quite a long time. Out of the 172 competitors, Lawson placed 124th in air rifle, Butler 102nd, and Schreiber placed 63rd. In the small board division, there were 61 competitors, with Butler coming in 39th. Be sure to congratulate them if you see them. For Studio 415, I'm Amelia Cisna. Cows, chickens, and horses make up a very slight fraction of what the Future Farmers of America Club deals with every day. In Studio 415 reporter Haley Carter's story, you'll see what the FFA Club is really about leadership and hard work. Future Farmers of America, or FFA, is a prevalent club at Carroll that not only deals with agriculture and farming, but also integrates itself into the community for the better. The club welcomes any student that wants to join, farmers or not. Some students think that joining FFA requires you to be a farmer, but this is not the case. Very few members of FFA are farmers outside of school. The rest of the members simply take an interest in agriculture or animal science and enjoy the hard work and community service that the club provides. It's not just farmers in there, that's a, that's a very important thing and like if you're a hard worker, you want to work hard and get out and help people, then you should participate in FFA. 
FFA isn't just at Carroll, though. There is an FFA association in all 50 states, including U.S. territories such as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. It is the largest student organization in the country and helps students in every state to prepare for their future through hard work and dedication, agriculture, or otherwise. FFA was one of the first clubs to come to Carroll. It was established in both Arcola High School and Huntertown High School before, but when the two schools consolidated into Carroll High School, FFA came with it. It is one of the oldest and largest clubs in the building. However, it has changed over time. As the community around them has changed, FFA has focused its attention on the leadership and skill building parts of its foundation, rather than the farming aspects. It's really developed over the years to focus on that leadership aspect and to be successful in any career that you want to be successful in. FFA organizes and participates in many activities that benefit the community, like the Special Needs Fall Festival and Adopt a Highway. Their Special Needs Fall Festival includes fun games and a wagon ride. The Adopt a Highway event consists of cleaning up the roads near Cedar Canyon. However, their most popular event is kindergarten tours, which occurs during the spring. The club goes to Solomon Farms and invites kindergartners from the NACS school system to learn about the animals and what it is like to live on the farm. We show them animals, we show them different grains, we play games. Um, I know they love it. We take them on hay rides. It's, it's pretty fun. They love it. Aside from their community work, FFA also competes in competitions across the nation. Being the largest student organization, there are many events to compete with. There are many different types, ranging from district contests concerning the summer projects the students complete to career development projects about horticulture and food science. Each school around the state is different. If you like working hard, agriculture, or both, FFA is the club for you. Make sure to ask any of the members or team leaders if you'd like to join. For Studio 415, I'm Haley Carter. That's all we have for today. Thanks for watching. If there is an event you would like covered, please tell us in advance by emailing us or talking to Bob Johnston in room 417. For all of us here at Studio 415, have a great week, Carol. Sunny days and friendly smiles Walk the halls with me Studio 415 Watch the news unfold Never hate a moment Students to decreed our future Come and join the fun Student.